All right, we'll go ahead and get, get started this morning with our class. We've got uh, not a whole lot of time left, uh, just uh, one month of classes, four weeks, so coming up soon. Uh, we'll, we'll be in a new quarter, so um, we'll, I hope, hope uh, this has been an encouraging, uh, engaging class for for you and and hopefully uh, we're getting ready for a new quarter so keep keep attending those Bible classes I know teachers work hard on those and we, we do appreciate and love our teachers for for doing that um, all right so we're gonna start off again with two truths and a lie as we as we get into our topic for this morning um, so let's uh, let's go to our, our little game we've been playing to start things off all right, first question on the list for today is, which of the following is not on the list of most expensive things sold on eBay? So which of these is not on the list of most expensive things sold on eBay? Is it Al Capone's Tommy gun, Shoeless Joe Jackson's baseball bat, or the Gulfstream jet? All right, so Al Capone's Tommy Gun, Shoeless Joe Jackson's Baseball Bat, or the Gulfstream 2 Jet. How many think it's Al Capone's Tommy Gun not sold on eBay? How many think Shoeless Joe Jackson's Baseball Bat was not? How many think a Gulfstream 2 Jet was not? All right, so the actual answer here is Al Capone's Tommy Gun was not. Shoeless Joe Jackson's Baseball Bat was sold for $577,000 on eBay. And the Gulfstream 2 jet sold for $4.9 million on eBay. All right, next question. Which of these is not in the top three of most spoken languages in the world? So this includes people speaking these languages as a second language. So which of these is not in the top three of most spoken languages in the world? Is it Mandarin Chinese? Is it Hindi? Or is it Spanish? All right. How many of you think that Mandarin Chinese is not in the top three? How many think Hindi is not in the top three? And how many think Spanish is not in the top three? Okay. So Mandarin Chinese has 1.1 billion speakers. Hindi has 615 million speakers, and Spanish has 534 million, which comes in at number four, English being obviously uh, number one. All right, next one. Which of these is not in the top three of largest cities in the world? This, this listing was taken from 2018. So which of these is not in the top three largest cities in the world? Is it Delhi, India? Is it Tokyo, Japan? Or is it Mexico City? All right, how many think that Delhi is not in the top three largest cities in the world? How many think Tokyo is not in the top? How many think Mexico City is not? All right, very good. Those of you who answered Mexico City would be correct. Uh, it was number five on the list with 21 and a half million. Um, Delhi comes in at 28.4 million and Tokyo at 37.4 million people living in the city. All right, next question. Which of these is not in the top three of the world's most valuable currencies? So trading currencies right now, which of these is not in the top three of the world's most valuable currency? Is it the US dollar? Is it the British pound sterling? Or is it the Kuwaiti dinar? All right, how many think the US dollar is not in the top three of the world's most valuable currencies? How many think it's the British pound sterling? And how many think it's the Kuwaiti dinar? All right, I was shocked at this one. Um, the U.S. dollar is actually ninth in the world in, uh, in most valuable currencies. Apparently, the British pound sterling uh, has not been completely upset by the euro and is still trading um, as number five on the, or yeah, it's, it's higher on the list. 
The Kuwaiti dinar is number one. It, it, it trades at $3.32 per Kuwaiti dinar. So there were actually, th I think, three Middle Eastern countries that had currencies that traded higher. All right, last question. Which of these NFL teams is not on the list of Super Bowl winners? Which of these is not on the list of Super Bowl winners? Is it the Miami Dolphins? Is it the Buffalo Bills? Or is it the Seattle Seahawks? How many think Miami Dolphins? How many think Buffalo Bills? How many think Seattle Seahawks? All right, we have a bunch of football fans here. Uh, the Buffalo Bills made four appearances, um, most of them against a little team called the Dallas Cowboys, and, uh, and did not ever make it uh, to the winning circle on that one. All right. So last, the last couple of weeks that we've met, we were talking about how do you build principles for a good ethical system? Again, we don't want to be the kind of people that come to ethical and moral dilemmas and we get stuck. We're like, we're making these decisions and we have these hard decisions in front of us and we have no framework to go off of. So we started talking about what are some biblical things, some principles that we could look at that would help us make good, ethical, good, moral decisions. And so we looked at these and again, we talked about how some of these we have to look that maybe some of these we might be, one might supersede another in a particular situation, but all in all, this is a great framework to have to start thinking about what kinds of decisions we should be making. So we looked at these principles, do no harm. Again, we, we don't want to harm others. Jesus taught us uh, that we should be gentle people. He set the precedent for that. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. We should be people that do not harm others. Uh, Christians, if anything, are supposed to be healers. Number two, we looked at do good. Every opportunity we have to do something good, uh, we should take, um, especially if there are things that don't cost us a lot but are going to benefit greatly others. We need to take advantage of that. We looked at telling the truth. Telling the truth is so important uh, for us to do. Tell the truth. And then we looked at keeping your promises, how important keeping your promises is. So if you've made a promise and you come across a dilemma where, well, what do I do? Opt with keeping your promise. Keeping your promise is something that, that uh, Jesus taught us. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. It's something that is important that we see through the Bible. We talked about covenant uh, and how, how that is very, very important to God. We talked about being fair. We talked about justice. So justice is, is being fair. We talked about how, obviously, we can't treat all things exactly the same, but we can look at relevant things that happen, relevant differences um, that, ma that make things differently that we might judge them. For example, I might not parent my six-year-old the same way that I parent my 16-year-old. That's a relevant difference, but I'm going to try to treat them fairly. Fairly means in other circumstances, I do treat them fairly, okay? I'm going to feed all of them. I'm going to clothe all of them. I'm going to take care of all of them. There are things that are the same, but there are things that are different. We looked at respecting autonomy. We talked about how respecting autonomy of others is, is a great way that we can help not only us, but other people make moral decisions. We talked about, though, that there's a couple of things. If, if you are immature, um, you, we may not give you the complete autonomy that you want. And if you're irrational, we may not give you the complete autonomy that you want. Um, and also we talked about if we do give others autonomy, they have to accept that whatever happens to them is on them. It's completely on them. And so that's when we give autonomy is if, you're mature, if we believe you're mature enough, you're being rational, and thirdly, you, you understand that whatever happens is, is on you now. You're making the decision. That's the whole part of autonomy. And then the last thing we talked about was fix what you break. Fix what you break. So uh, we, the, God's, the whole story of the Bible is fixing a broken relationship. Okay, uh, Man and God used to walk together. That relationship was broken. Part of what God said is we're in the, in the business of mending things. We're in the business of fixing what, we, what has been broken. 
Um, and so we talked about the importance of fixing what was broken. So today we're going to talk about what Jesus says about truth. Um, so today will be probably a little bit more um, uh, what we're going to get into the Bible and look at these things and not necessarily look at um, an ethical system as such, but we're going to look at what Jesus said about truth because surprisingly he had a lot to say about truth. Where do we get truth? What is truth? Where does it come from? And so we're going to look at what Jesus said about truth. So I'm going to start off with an easy question. Is Jesus more interested in love or in truth? Easy question. <laughs> okay. Both, I didn't say both and. I said, is Jesus more interested in love or truth? What do we think? Does anyone care to expound? To give it a shot. Okay, okay. So we see some of the same listed in there. All right. Any others have any thoughts on that? Is Jesus more interested in love or truth? Okay, okay. Really can't have one without the other. All right. Do we sometimes treat Jesus as if he thinks one is more important than another? Do we sometimes treat um, our Christianity as if one is more important than another? At the Southwest Church of Christ, which is more important, love or truth? I, I want us to begin thinking today about Jesus' stance on truth and how important he takes it. Um, how important of a thing is truth to Jesus? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so kind of a trick question to open off, to open up. But I'd like us to look at a few verses to start talking about this. The first one is from John chapter 18 and verse 37. If you want to uh, turn there or look that up uh, in a Bible app, we're going to look at John chapter 18 and verse 37. This is the interchange between Pilate and Jesus. Uh, Jesus is before Pilate. He's basically on trial. Pilate is trying to determine if he's a criminal, who he is, what he's doing, what he's all about, how he's going to sentence him, what's going to happen, because he's been brought before him, and this is the interchange that happened. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. So we know that Jesus talked a lot about love. Uh, many of his teachings were about how to love each other better. Uh, his, one of his last things he said to the disciples was, you need to love each other and that's how the world will know that you are mine. Many of Jesus' miracles started with his love for someone. Someone died, someone was sick, people were hungry. That started with love, and he would do a miracle in order for those things to happen. And again, all of those things were to prove who he was. But in this passage, Jesus says he has a primary reason that he came into the world. What is that? to bear witness to the truth, to testify to truth. He came into the world to testify to truth. Jesus says his primary reason to come into the world was to testify to truth. So truth is important to Jesus and should be to us as well. So point number one today of things that Jesus said about truth is the purpose of the life of Jesus was to testify to truth. The purpose of the life of Jesus was to testify to truth. And again, if we call ourselves Christians, that means we are Christ followers, then what should an important part of our, our being, our purpose be? It should be testifying to truth. And so we have a lot to figure out, don't we? If we're gonna testify, we better be ready. If we're gonna testify, we better know what we're going to say. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we follow in Jesus' footsteps? If, if Jesus came to testify to truth, then what does that mean for us? Now, 
If Jesus said he came to testify to truth, I'm gonna ask the following question, and the following question can be answered by any judge or any parent. How do you tell if someone is telling the truth? How do you tell if someone is telling the truth? Is that possible? How do you tell? Kids come up to you two different stories. Witnesses come up two different stories. Well, there's a lot of things. I mean, some of it's in, in the way they say it. Uh, some of it is where they maintain a consistent story, so are they contradicting themselves uh, at different points in time. Okay, okay. So the way that they're saying it, um, you can kind of tell if someone is, is maybe not quite telling the truth. Um, you know, you might see someone kind of look away, their eyes, there's different things that people look for, investigators when they're watching people uh, that will tell, well, they, they might not be telling the complete truth here. Also looking at consistency, as, as was mentioned. So consistency, is your story consistent? Is it conflicting at some point? If you tell it three times, is it going to be the exact same story every time? Good, other thoughts? How do you tell someone's telling the truth? Yes. Okay, okay, so have you been a good, uh, a good witness in the past? Have there, have there been things that you have, you have said, um, this is the way it was and, and it was found that that was truth? Then hopefully you're continuing in that, in that line. Good, others? How do we tell someone's telling the truth? Okay, all right, okay, yes? Sometimes you just can't. Some people can look you straight in the eye and why you're Okay, all right, exactly, yep. Sometimes you cannot tell when people are, are pulling the wool over your eyes. You cannot tell. Any other thoughts? How do you tell if someone's telling the truth? What if you have three or more children? One of them comes in and says it was someone else's fault. Is there any other way to verify this? Let's say you have five children. Which one do you pull in and which one do you, your oldest two come to you? This has been happening, who do you go to? In my family, we can go to the littlest and say, who did this? And we'll get the answer, okay? My, my, point, my point is not necessarily that dynamic, but in general, you can tell someone is telling the truth if someone else can verify, right? So we have other people that can verify. We can look at certain things about the way that they're sharing. We can look at their past. We can look at a bunch of different things. So I want us to think about, what about Jesus? Was he, was he telling the truth? Even when he says, this is my purpose, I came to testify to the truth. Would, he, would we say he was a good person that we would say, okay, let's listen to his testimony. His testimony is true about telling the truth. So, what truth was Jesus testifying about? What truth was Jesus here to testify about? What, was, what truth was he trying to share? Let's look at a few scriptures that, again, will, will help us understand that. Um, John chapter 17 and verse 17 is where I'd like for us to, to look on this one. A very short verse, but again, something uh, Jesus was praying about, something Jesus was, was talking about. John 17, 17, you might have even had this as a memory verse at some point. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus praying for his, uh, his followers, people that believed in him. Sanctify them by the truth. What does sanctify mean? What does sanctify mean? Okay, to set apart. Other thoughts? Any, any thoughts as why are we setting people apart? What are we setting them apart for? Is it just to set them apart? Okay, we're setting them apart to, 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 to designate them as holy. 
okay? Another, a couple of words we could use for this is to purify. Um, so to purify um, from sin, to set apart or declare holy is to sanctify. So Jesus says, sanctify them, set them apart, declare them pure, purify them from sin by what? By truth. So we are, part of what sets us apart as holy and consecrated to God is truth. Now, is part of what sets us apart the fact that we've been bought with the blood of the Lamb? Absolutely. That's, that is our story. That is, that is how, how we are identified. But we are also identified as consecrated, holy, different because of the truth. Because that's why we have been set apart. That's why we are sanctified is because of truth. Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. And then he's, what did he say is the truth? Your word, your word is truth. So God's word is truth. So Jesus said people are sanctified by truth. And then he said, what is truth? Truth is God's word. So point number two that Jesus said about truth is God's word is truth. God's word is truth. The things that come from God are truth. This is according to Jesus. Now, this is where we start to lose some people. Is everything that we have from God really true? And again, we've kind of talked about this earlier in the class, but I can also ask this question. Is everything from God always fun or joyful? No. Is joy equal to truth? Truth does not always equal happy, fun, joy, does it? We have to, have to, have to separate those two. This is the mistake that we make often, is this does not make me happy, so it must not be true. And that is not an ethical system that can always work. Because there's some people out there that are made happy by really terrible things. It makes me happy to go rob and get whatever I want from other people or from other institutions. It makes me happy when I hurt other people. It makes me happy to make fun of you. It makes me happy, and the list goes on and on. Happiness does not equal truth. Just because something doesn't make us feel good doesn't mean that it's not true. God's word is truth, even if it doesn't say the most fun things. So we have to start looking at that. Now, this part where we start looking at, but what is God's word and what is truth? This is where Christianity starts to kind of separate and go a different direction from other religions. Truth in Christianity is proclaimed as more than just a set of teachings. Let's look at a couple of verses that will help us uh, kind of develop this topic. Uh, the first one is John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. So remember, our last point is that Jesus said God's word is truth. John 1.14 says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the, one, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Who is the word talking about? It's Jesus, isn't it? The word made, was made into flesh and came into the world. And he came full of grace and full of truth. Now, if Jesus told us, sanctify, if Jesus was praying, sanctify them by truth, your word is truth. But then we also know who, what is truth. Truth is Jesus. Truth isn't just a set of teachings. Truth is a person in Christianity. We know that everything that Jesus was, was identified as the truth, all right? He is the Word, and since we said God's Word is truth, then Jesus is truth. This is also mentioned again in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, starting in verse 6. Take a look at that one. In John 14, 6 and verse 7, this is what it says. 
Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. All right, Jesus says, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. And then the Bible tells us that the, the word came into the world. Jesus is truth. Jesus tells, talks about himself the same way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we've talked about a bunch of different ways people think about truth. One of the ways people think about truth is, well, whatever's good for you may not be best for me, or there are lots of different truths out there. But Jesus said some very interesting words here. He didn't have, he had specific word choices. Did you notice that he didn't say, I am a way or a truth? I am a way to life. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, these are very specific words that Jesus uses. That he, It doesn't really leave any argument, does it? So according to Jesus, how do you get to the Father? Through him. One way. Do you earn it? Do you come to church enough in order to get enough points in order to go to heaven? Can you do enough good stuff in order to build up credit so that when you get to the heavenly gates, you swipe that card and they go, yep, you've got enough points. That's not how it works. Jesus says there's one way, and it's through me. And why is that? Because Jesus is truth. So we, do, we see that, that Jesus proclaims himself as truth, probably the most bold claim that Jesus made. And let me submit that if you want to follow Jesus, you must follow him fully. And this means that everything Jesus teaches, you must take as truth. Again, not, not that everything is fun, not that everything is joyful, but if we are going to be Christians, and if we really believe that what Jesus said is true, that he is the truth, he has all truth, then we have to take everything he says as truth. And we must believe and follow everything that he says because we believe that it is truth. So we must believe him to be the only way, and we must believe that he is the only one with the keys of life. So point number three that Jesus made about truth. Jesus is the word, and therefore Jesus is the truth, the one and only truth. Now, at this point, what C.S. Lewis said made a lot of sense. You have this Jesus guy that proclaims that he is the way, the truth, and the only way to life. You can't just say things like that, Jesus. So there's something different about Jesus. And C.S. Lewis basically said either he's mad, he's bad, or he's God. Now the way C.S. Lewis put it was this. Either Jesus is a lunatic, he's a liar, or he's Lord. When you have someone going around saying, I am the only way to God. I am the only truth that there is. They only fit one of three categories. You're nuts. You're a liar. Or maybe you really are. So which one is it? We have to make that choice of who Jesus really is. So I really want to believe that Jesus is not lying. And I really think a lot of things that Jesus says are nice and good. So I really hope that he's not a lunatic. Because he's got a lot of good things to say. But how can I believe that he is the only truth and the only way to life if he died? So we look at some other, other movements, other religions. People get behind someone who's leading, and they're like, this is, this is the way we need to go. This is what we do. And then they die, and then what begins to happen to their movement? It begins to die out. Maybe people say, well... So, so if someone comes along and says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and then they die... 
Now, tell me about Jesus, though. Tell me some good news. Why can I believe that Jesus is really the way, the truth, and the life? Everybody knows the answer. He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. How do we believe that someone is the way and the truth and the life if they die? Well, let me tell you something. He died, but then he walked out of the grave. That's how you can believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But some people might say, well, that's nice. Why didn't he stick around after his death? If, if, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, why didn't he say, you know what, you guys just need me to stay here because you, you're, still, you're still not getting it. So why didn't he stick around? Thoughts? Okay. An advocate. Explain. Expound. The Holy Spirit. Okay, and what is the Holy Spirit's job? You know, it says in the one passage, to convict of sin and of truth and falsehood. That's all good stuff. That's all very true. But there's also the road to 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 be with us and to guide us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. To be there with us, to guide us, uh, to be a comfort to us, all of those things. But let's look at John chapter 16 and verse uh, 13 for one specific thing that was mentioned. So again, the question is, if Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and he died but he came back, why didn't he stick around? Why didn't he stay and this is what Jesus said before he died. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into what? All the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. All right. Point four that Jesus said about truth. Jesus told us that after he left, he would send the Spirit to guide us into all truth. Now, again, if we kind of follow, hopefully this is making sense. Classes make sense in my head when I'm writing them out. I hope that they do to you as well. But here's my logic. The purpose of the life of Jesus was to testify to truth. He also said God's word is truth. But then we found out that Jesus is the word and therefore Jesus is truth. And then he said he's the one and only truth. But then he said, but then he died, and then he came back, but he didn't stay with us. Why? Because he told us that after he left, he would, spend, he would send the Spirit to guide us into all truth. Now, allow me a moment on the soapbox. Why do we have a truth crisis in the world today? Why does the world not believe that Christians have the truth? If we believe we have the, the only truth that is available, we have a corner on it. We know exactly who it is. Why do others not believe? Thoughts? Our lives can always match up. Okay. Okay. Okay, our lives don't always look true. They don't look like we're the best followers of Jesus. Okay, we may not be the best representatives. Our truth would limit their freedom. Okay, all right. So if, if we were sometimes the things that we say that Jesus said are limiting to the freedom of other people, and so they don't care for that, um, for those thoughts. Yes. Also, this is we don't share our truth in love. It is a claim and symbol. Okay. Okay. So we don't share the truth in love, which again, which is a, a coming topic in I think the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about what to do when others have moral dilemmas and what to do when you have one at your home and how to teach 
uh, ethical decision making in your own home. And so we're going to talk about some of that. What do you do when other people you know have some dilemmas? And, and one of the things we're going to talk about is you, you teach the truth in love. All right? So what, why is it that people don't believe that, that, we have, um, that we have the truth? I think it's because we're not allowing the Spirit to do the Spirit's work. We are quick to give our opinions when asked for the truth instead of deferring to God's Holy Spirit. We do things under our own wisdom and our own power, and we smother the glory of the Holy Spirit. I believe that we need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our churches so that the world may know the truth. And I also believe that even though the Holy Spirit himself stood in front of some people, they would still choose to believe their own truth. That is the hope, but also the sadness of Christianity, is even though we know the truth, and even though that truth has set us free, there are others that will remain in bondage forever. Truth is not fun, but truth is truth. So last question, how can we live in God's truth? How can we live in God's truth? So we're, we're coming to the end of class here. Let me, let me wrap up with a few verses and then we'll, we'll finish up. John chapter 3, verse 21. How can we live in God's truth is the question. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. We will get more into this in a few weeks, so I don't want to camp out on it here, but I do want us to see that our Lord and Savior told us that our lives should be lived in the light, in the open, for people to see. What song do we sing sometimes? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's from something Jesus said. Don't hide it. Let it shine. And right here, Jesus tells us, those that live by the truth live their lives in the open. Now, is Franklin perfect? Everybody go this way. But should Franklin live his life in the open, in the light? Yes. Again, it's scary. I don't want people to see my flaws. I don't want people to know I'm not perfect. But maybe they'll respect the truth if I do. If I live out there and I say, this is my life, I'm not perfect, but that's because I'm depending on someone who is the truth and who can get me to God. Jesus says, live your lives in the open, live your lives plainly in the light so that others may see what has been done in the sight of God. John chapter 8, verses 31 and verse 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So point number five that Jesus said about truth. To live in truth, we must live our lives in plain sight and hold to the teachings of Jesus. So this is how we live in the truth. We live our lives in plain sight for all to see, in the light, and we hold to the teachings of Jesus. And when we hold to the teachings of Jesus, he says, the truth will set us free. Now, this indicates loyalty. This indicates steadfastness. This indicates not giving up. So these things are important to Jesus. Stick with my teachings. Obey them, and the truth will set you free. All right. In coming, uh, coming up, we're going to be hitting, um, let's see, when others face ethical dilemmas. Yeah, this is a little bit off because we had a couple of weeks where we missed. But next up is when others face ethical dilemmas, how do you help them? Uh, after that, when ethical dilemmas hit home or, and teaching children right from wrong. And then uh, we're going to clump, uh, basically, that, there's one more week after that, so we're clumping together uh, applying truth and what's a really cool word that's called cruciformity. And we're going to, to look at that. How do we apply this? All the stuff that we've learned and talked about, how does this get applied? Thanks for being here this morning. I uh, hope you've been encouraged. Let's live in truth.